Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, Wuchum's, Professor Wuchum's uh, second lecture. Uh, on Wednesday, um, Simon also already introduced Wuchum, so I'm going to be very brief indeed, because you do not want to listen to me, you want to listen to Wuchum. Um, but I think we all agree that the first lecture was, was for, at least for me, an eye-opener in many, many ways, very interesting, precisely the kind of thing we wanted to, to, to hear and to have happened, and we had lots of interesting discussions afterwards. And I'm sure that this afternoon's lecture will be uh, just as stimulating and interesting. Um, the first lecture was Pillow and Mirror. Um, we talked about pillows and mirrors, absence as subjectivity. Um, today, I understand we're going to go from three-dimensional to two-dimensional, and we'll be talking about representing vacancy, absence as memory. So please join me in welcoming Professor Wu. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, that's not a microphone. Oh, God. <laughs> Electricity. It's fine. No danger. Thank you, Hans. And uh, uh, yes, the last time I talked about objects, mainly personal objects, and uh, the idea of absence, how the absence was uh, sort of internalized into the design and the perception. So today I would basically deal with painting and the eventually a form we call the rubbing, ink rubbings. So they are both two-dimensional. But the idea is still about absence or representation of absence. And before I start, I want to explain more closely what I mean by absence in our historical analysis, and how one can expect to read, like a reading absence. How can we expect to read absence, which is by definition not there. So that seems contradictory. <laughs> so I want to explain this. <clears throat> I'm aware of the rich philosophical discourse on this topic, absence, there are many other people who talk about it. But I'm not a philosopher, and philosophy is not the place I embarked on this project from. I become interested in absence because once I started to read it in art, it was led to a broad range of images. Their shared visual logic points to a deep-rooted fascination in representing disappearance, erasure, and effacement, that transcends a particular time, place, and culture. So I start from, uh, actually yesterday, I think there's a question, is this just for China or ancient China? I answer no, actually I see it everywhere. So I gave you some example, that actually you, you, you see it everywhere. So uh, in the last lecture I gave you, the first example was a Chinese, ancient Chinese tomb. Oh, sorry. It's here. Uh, a second century BC tomb in the uh, Ma Wang Dui. Uh, there is an empty seat. The red dots there represent an empty seat in this tomb. And uh, I explained like uh, the technique of framing all these objects, frame the tomb, and uh, make it a vacant empty center. And uh, all these objects uh, restore the senses for the disease. There's music, there's viewing, there's food, there are all these pleasures. So that's one Chinese example. But there are more. Should I point here? Oh. Slow response. I hope you can stop here. Okay, I had to learn this thing. So here are some pictures I just try to explain from A, B, C, D. So A is a second century BC stone carving from, from Bahut, India, showing people worshiping the Buddha in an enclosed sanctuary. But the enlightened one, the Buddha, is not seen in his place. It's an empty throne. So we see here is a throne in the middle, surrounded by people. B is a 6th century marble relief from Syria, representing the tomb of Christ. The horizontal recess at the center exposed the tomb's interior, now empty after Jesus' resurrection. 
the miracle must have just occurred as a stone slab that originally blocked the opening is still falling in midair. It's uh, very beautiful. You see here, it's uh, was covering this. Yeah, it's still in sea, very grim. It's a picture from Dirk Reiner's photographic series called The Deathly Steel, Pictures of Concentration Camp. In discussing this image of a formal killing field, the art historian Woodick Bear asks a very interesting question. He said, why does nothing grow in the sandy patches at the front after so many years is a bear? Then D, Andy Warhol's electric chair, is perhaps the grimmest among the numerous empty chairs we find in paintings, photographs, and installations. It's very interesting why people, in, all these artists, contemporary artists, love to use chair. For example, a definition, a chair, uh, by definition, is designed as a receiver of a hypothetical body. But a used chair, we see all here. A used chair in a painting or installation inevitably signifies the missing subject. So all these things are used, the Van Gogh chair and the other chairs, so this, uh, the Chinese Empress chair, this all has a subject. Suppose that's uh, from a uh, 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 family portrait and this member died, so the chair is falling. Um, so all these things imply the missing subject. In Andy Warhol's case, this is the last case I showed. Okay, good. So in Warhol's case, an uninformed viewer might wonder how many men and women had spent the last minute of their lives in this particular chair in Sing Sing before it was retired in 1963. The answer, probably you know, is 614. So these and other images and works have been studied in different ways. For example, in light of an iconism, like the Indian example, in terms of visual narrative, trauma, and the fascination with death. So there have been many studies about this. What is less discussed, I believe, is a simpler but uh, fundamental issue. That is absence as both the subject of representation and a general visual strategy employed throughout the history of water art. It is a visual strategy because in all these cases, the sense of omission and loss is still realized through images and visual framing. So that's a different from philosophy. So we still see images and we realize there's something missing. So still a type of representation. Uh, <clears throat> in other words, here an image serves two seemingly opposite purposes at once, representing something tangible and concrete while alluding to something that eludes conventional stylistic analysis or iconographic identification. In other words, in reading such an image, our interest shifts from what is depicted to what is omitted, or more precisely, to the dialectical relationship between depicting and the depicting. depicting. The general argument here is that instead of providing visual information about the subject representing uh, represented, certain images, installations, and performance deliberately erase or withhold such information. So we have an empty chair, we don't have the person, but we still know that's the Buddha. So it's a erase or withhold the information about the subject. If this argument can be established, then we need to explore the reason behind such works as uh, empty signs and their expected reaction from us. My reading of absence, therefore, differs from a traditional Chinese literati approach, which emphasizes the harmony between what is empty and what is tangible. In Chinese term, called xu shi, it's a harmony, indifference, whatever. But instead, I focus on the tension. There's a tension between presence and absence as a special artistic and the art historical phenomenon. 
That on the one hand, reading absence provides a particular angle to analyze works of art. On the other hand, such reading must lead to contextual and historical interpretation. So we don't stop here at a general level. We can focus on particular historical episode. Actually, that's today's purpose. So today's lecture will focus on the 17th century China, uh, which many historians have defined with good reason as an early modern period in China. By analyzing some uh, paintings and other works, I hope to demonstrate how these images, though empty in various ways, conveyed complex political and psychological meanings at this particular historical moment. So <coughs> I start. My first example is a quite an interesting painting, but the relatively unknown right now in Nanjing Museum. Yes, hard to see, but I will give you some details. So here is a big one. So this example is a painting made in 1651 by two painters, Wu Hong and Fan Qi, two well-known artists from Nanjing. The painting is mounted in a hand hanging scroll format. The mounting above and below the composition is covered with dense colophons, mainly commemorative poems, but a dozen or so literary figures active in the 18th and 19th century. So I'm talking about above the picture and the below the picture, those were later colophons. So demonstrating the continuous attraction of the painting over the 200 years after its creation in mid 17th century. The painting itself bears two inscriptions. So here is one, here's one. The shorter one, so here in the bracket, you can see the shorter one along the left edge is written by the two artists who titled the painting An Informal Portrait of courtesan Kome, styled Baiman, and identified the painting as a collaborative work between them, between two painters. They then noted the time and location of the painting's creation. It was done in the fall of 17, uh, 1651 in a place called the Zhu Yuan, or the Zhu Garden in Nanjing. I haven't been able to find this garden in textual sources, but it is interesting to note that Zhu is the imperial surname of the Ming Dynasty, which had just perished six years ago before, and that Nanjing was the first capital of the fallen regime. The other and longer inscription, which is written in darker ink near the center of the picture, is written by Yu Huai, a contemporary writer famous for his retrospective records of the pleasure quarters along the Qinhuai River in Nanjing before the fall of Ming. Part of this inscription, the long one in the middle, part of this inscription reappears in Yu Huai's book called the Wooden Bridge Miscellany, Ban Qiao Zha Ji, which he finally completed 42 years later in 1693. So very interesting example of this inscription actually is a piece later uh, integrated into his book. The inscription offers a short biography of Ko Mei, the subject of the portrait. It starts with a general description of the courtesan I read. Here is uh, my translation. Easier to we'll see here. Ko Mei, who has a style named Bai Men, <coughs> was a graceful and characteristic by a kind of quiet beauty. But she was also unrestrained in spirit and unconventional in lifestyle. She could compose music and was good at painting orchid. She had some basic knowledge of rhyming and could chant poems, but her poetic style was too popular, and she couldn't eventually reach an advanced level in this art. So here Yu Huai, the writer of this uh, inscription, a self-styled connoisseur of top Nanjing courtesans, didn't give Kome particularly high marks in terms of literary talent. Uh, what on his admiration to this courtesan is the woman's personality, especially the life experience intertwined with the fall of Ming. So it's in the second part I read. 
When Bayman was 18 or 19, she was bought by the Duke of Defending the State of Ming Dynasty, that's Ming Dynasty, Bao Guogong, to be his concubine. He stored her in a gold chamber, just like Li Zhangwu had treated Xie Qiuniang in the past. In the third month of Jia Shen, remember this date, 1644, the capital fell, and the Duke surrendered himself to Manchu conquerors. And so he became a traitor of the husband. His household was confiscated. Baiman, the woman, paid the duke a thousand cash to redeem herself. Clad in a short jacket and riding a horse, she returned home with a single fee female servant to abandon this rich household. Once home in Nanjing, she claimed the status of a female knight errant, a xia knight errant, had a garden pavilion built where she gathered guests and parted every day with men of letters, heated with wine, she would either sing or cry, lamenting the decline of beauty and separation of lovers. Mr. Qian Mujai or Qian Qian Yi wrote this poem. All the good sisters are sweet and beautiful. For 18 years, their flower affairs basically courted them, you know. Have enchanted people, but I'm afraid of meeting her again today by the Qinghuai River while her rouge tears will stand my clothes. So the last line, Yu Huai, and the inscription with his signature, specifying that he was writing in a water pavilion along the Qinghuai River, the Nanjing Pleasure Quarters, which was Kongmei's home. So he was writing the Qinghuai River and talking about this woman who lived there before her death. So the return to the painting, the painting, now it's basically the inscription of the person, biography, now we talk about painting. The painting is executed with the ink along a piece of white paper, now it's darkened, it looks yellowish, but originally it was white paper. About 80 centimeters tall and 60 centimeters wide, it's a relatively modest in size for an informal portrait and for private viewing. But the painting, the style of the painting, however, departs from a conventional informal portrait due to its powerful, indeed overwhelming, contrast in shape and tonality. A giant tree dominates the right half of the <coughs> composition. It's a scabless body and multiple cavities, you can see everywhere, show its great age, must be very old, huge tree. The broken, piercing branches further reveal the hardship it has endured. You see very interesting, all these, uh, those kinds of branches, it's again, it's broken branches everywhere. So it's not just age, there's some sense of uh, calamity, hardship involved. The tree is very dark and seems ominous. Wu Hong, who painted this image and other landscape elements in the painting, went over the main trunk and branches several times with a thick brush. If you study this, just over, over, just make it darker and darker. The accumulated darkness from starting contrast with the woman sitting under the tree whose shape is barely visible. Can you find her? She's right here. Indeed, to produce such a sharp contrast between the two images must be deliberate, since nowhere in traditional Chinese painting can we find a similar case like that. At least I haven't. In opposition to the ragged and brooding look of the tree, Komei's portrait depicted by Fan Qi, the second painter, is delineated in dilute ink and the extremely faint lines. So here you can see how thin is the, the line, almost uh, invisible. That's uh, enlarged many, many times. So our original painting, you can compare those dark, this volume, and here, the image. Her face, her facial features, again unique among Chinese portrait paintings, are almost indistinct. Oh, go back. Here you can see the face. Basically, two thin dots represent the eyes, 
a short line stands for the mouth, and the sharp chin seems to belong to a skull rather than a person. All these features generate the impression of a ghostliness, a vacant image which emphasizes absence over presence. So much more can be said about this painting. Uh, actually, uh, I think uh, I really want to write a long article about this painting, but we don't have time here. Just for example, I can give you some, uh, some uh, just uh, possibilities. For example, we may consider the relationship between word and image. Yu Huai's posthumous biography of Komei seems to form a verbal counterpart to the woman's ghostly image, like a here and there. Actually, this part is very similar to epitaph. This kind of writing, where square is like a car with the images, again, very real. So you can study there. We may speculate on the meaning of the setting. The desolate landscape had nothing to do with the pleasure quarters on the Qinghuai River, but suggests a wild, wild space for a homeless ghost. For example, this kind of the river, water, you know, it's the Chinese poetry always allude to some kind of desolate kind of wildness. Uh, we can contemplate a possible reaction of the tree, this ominous tree, uh, by a contemporary viewer. For example, a gentleman saw this, uh, what he would uh, say or feel, given that the last Ming emperor had hung himself just a few years before on an old tree in Beijing. So the tree at that time, I believe, had a very different meaning. So especially this kind of truth. <clears throat> so um, we should certainly connect the painting to a lasting trope in Chinese literature in which female ghosts consistently embody the lingering memory of a fallen dynasty. That's from Tang even bef before there was uh, this uh, literary trope. My purpose in this lecture, however, is to use this painting to exemplify a particular mode of artistic expression, which gained considerable currency and acquired the various forms at this particular time. So if a map talking about the absence, I feel at this time, just the 17th century, this certainly, this mode, an empty center became really quite popular among certain people. Shared features of these forms include an elusive or empty visual center, the reliance on a powerful framing, so you shape to the, the edge, the framing became very important. An atmosphere of a mourning, and the artist's self-identity as a witness and the remember of a historical tragedy. So this, I will give you more examples, but these are shared features. So what is this tragedy? This historical tragedy, as Yu Huai already mentioned in this inscription, is the fall of the Ming Dynasty. So, in 1644, <clears throat> some historians have argued that this year was only the beginning of the end, that it took much longer for the Ming to perish, and for the Qing, the following regime established by the Manchus from the north, to consolidate his control over the vast country. This argument is correct, but it shouldn't diminish the extraordinary political significance and the psychological impact of 1644, <coughs> To those who remained loyal to the Ming, the fall of the capital and the suicide of the Chongzhen Emperor that year were always felt as unspeakable pain, violence, and the devastation. Calling themselves Yi Min, or remnant subjects of the former dynasty, these Ming loyalists perceived the Manchu conquest as a crisis of culture, tradition, and race. The forced change of costume and hairstyle were especially traumatic, viewed as a forced conversion to barbarism. Indeed, to many such men, this uh, Yi Min loyalist, it was not only the Ming that perished in 1644, 
their own lives were also cut short at that moment, even if they continued living. That's Wang Fuzhi, a famous writer, politician, who refused to serve the new regime and became a Buddhist monk, asked in a sacrificial eulogy he wrote for himself. He said, do you, you means himself, do you think that you are dying only now? You are already dead in the year Jiaxian, 1644. That's what we just said. Such a projected martyrdom was expressed through symbolic gestures and behavior. The Yimin painter Zhu Da acted out death by refusing to speak and the feigning madness, whereas Gui Zhuang and the Chao Ming Sheng imprisoned themselves in graveyards as befitted the living dead. Actually, this picture is, uh, is above. They put themselves into a, like a grave house. There's no door. So people deliver some food. So they become part of the dead. So um, it has been suggested that the, this loyalist behavior mimicked ritual mourning for deceased parents. So the dynasty, Ming dynasty, like deceased parents. So that's kind of prolonged mourning. And usually mourning took like three years, so it could be even longer. So this kind of mourning. Uh, so that they could sustain the posthumous memory of the parish dynasty. So now if we return to Cole May's portrait, we can see that it carries a similar significance as an expression of ritual mourning. The painting must have been made not long after Komei's untimely death, which Yu Huai reported in his later book, Ban Chiao Da Ji. But what is mourned for in this uh, collaborative work is not just the courtesan herself alone. Because of her will, her power of, of this woman, uh, power to retain her, her independence, uh, Gu Mei had become a loyalist symbol for many of these Ming survivors. So this picture actually on one level is a portrait, uh, is uh, the memory of a particular courtesan. She was brave, she maintained her independence. On a higher level, she, really her death had merged into a greater death that was Ming Dynasty than the picture at that level. So we return to inscription. There is a painting was painted in the Garden of Zhu. Zhu is the surname of Ming Dynasty. And the one painter named his location is exactly the name of the tomb of the Ming Emperor, Zhongshan. So all these uh, have like some secret meaning there. This meaning of the portrait is spelled out by Qian Tianye, I cited earlier, in another poem which he dedicated to Kou Mei's memory. He wrote, a beautiful woman, though withered, still remain, remembers her lord's, lord's favor. Lord's here, Jun actually means emperor. Do you know Bai Men, the female knight errant? Her heart remains alive, even after yellow earth has covered her coffin. A long strand of smoke issuing from a perfumed pallet it is her fragrant soul. That's, again, this kind of posthumous. It's very similar to the feeling we see here. This reading of the portrait guides us to my second group of examples. Here, harder to see. Although these are all landscape paintings, as you can see, without any figure in them, I would suggest that they share both the visual strategy and the political message of Komei's portrait. Created by Ming loyalist painters, these pictures all represent the Xiaoling mausoleum of the Ming founder, uh, Zhongshan in Nanjing, a subject which Johnson Hay has studied extensively. What I want to add to this discussion includes two points. Basically, Johnson already identified basically this building, I put in brackets, actually is identified by the inscription here, is the mausoleum of the founder of the Ming Dynasty. So appear in many paintings and others. So it became really a favorite subject of these uh, Nanjing, especially Nanjing loyalist painters. So I won't repeat his identification. There's a textual evidence and other things. I want to add 
two points. The first is a split between pictorial representation and the reality. We know that the mausoleum was neglected for several decades after the Qing conquest. As a result, it suffered severe vandalism and damage, basically from 1670s to 1680s. So for example, Gu Yanwu, a leader of the Ming, uh, Ming Yimin loyalists, recorded that when he visited the place in 1655, he encountered the quote unquote the ruins of the old ritual buildings and shrines and that a great stele near the main gate had fallen to the ground. So he saw those things. But these paintings show no effort to depict physical damage. Instead, the structure intact and whole exists as an eternal symbol of the Ming in the artist's mind, if not in reality. So the image and reality are split. We always see it's pretty intact. There's nothing ruined, whatever. But the second point I want to say is, these paintings demonstrate a consistent effort to frame the mausoleum as a hollow center within a powerful landscape of dark ink and dense brushwork. So um, very dark, like here in the middle is very bright, white. And here you see the wave of this landscape and in the middle, it's, again, it's like an eye. It's very elusive, almost transparent, this feeling. So the visual logic is very similar if you compare this and that, very different subject matter, but they follow a similar visual structure. So there is these two parallels, the concept of a spiritual center authority and a vacant visual center shared by these paintings. And these two parallels in turn lead me to a third group of image, which all are centered on the image of a stone stele. I'm talking about, you see here, yeah, very light. Here is a white thing, it's a big stele, stone stele. So this is my third group. I have discussed these steely images in relation to the concept of ruins in a recent book that just came out in London. Here I want to connect these images with another different theme, basically the 17th century painting, to explore shared pictorial conventions and the political implications. First, what is steely in Chinese culture? From its inception, from the beginning, the stele or bay was the chief means in Chinese culture to comm for commemoration. Established by an individual, it commemorated a man's conduct in public service, or bore a concise biography composed from a posthumous point of view. It's often a person died, then you establish things like this. Erected in front of religious and ceremonial buildings, it recorded the origin and history of the structure. The study, therefore, defined the legitimate site where history and memory were constructed and presented to the public. When someone looked back at the past, it was natural that study would stand out from other architectural forms to command his retrospective gaze. We can therefore understand why from the 1650s to 1680s, it became a common practice for Ming loyalists to visit old cities, and why broken cities became a particular meaningful trope in their writings. Qian Shengbai has written on this topic, especially broken city. Among his examples, Gu Yanwu, uh, I mentioned earlier, he's a leader of Ming loyalists, paid a frequent visit to the tombs of early Ming emperors in Nanjing and Beijing, and they explicitly spoken about the morphal stele standing in the middle of the imperial road. Hu Yan will also visited an ancient stele of Fenyang in Shanxi, a poem he wrote on that trip ends with these two lines I read. 
Reading this broken city with my friends, we mourn the past and present with sorrowful hearts. So again, steady, steady. Another famous Ming royalist, Fu Shan, even dreamed of an ancient city with, quote unquote, a broken, illegible text. As Bai Qian Shen has noted, these and similar expressions deliberately echoed an historical episode in the 13th century, three years after the Mongol army captured the southern Song capital at the present-day Hangzhou, the poet Zhang Yan visited the famous West Lake in the city. Facing an abundant city, this Zhang Yan 13th century wrote, so much misfortune has befallen my former country. Touching a broken city, my heart is stricken for the present. There is a puzzling fact, however, especially for our historians. Although the image or imagery of broken city became so prevalent in literature and in actual life, visiting broken city, writing about broken city, to my knowledge, no Yimin loyalist artist actually painted Broken Steely. Mm -hmm. uh, what they did, just uh, this uh, actually perfect Steely, but empty. So um, of one of these works was this work by an artist named Zhang Feng, who died in 1662. He's a loyalist Yimin artist from Nanjing, who once traveled to the north to pay respect to the Ming imperial tombs, we know that, after the Manchus takeover. Uh, the little fan painting is dated to 1659. And uh, uh, it depicts a man in Ming attire standing before an enormous city. Given the artist's political attitude, the painting seems to carry an autobiographical significance because he did travel to the north to see those tomb cities. The contrast between the city's monumentality and the desolate environment is highlighted in the poem that Zhang inscribed above the picture. The poem reads, chilly mist, withered grass, old trees, remote mountains, an imposing city stands in a place devoid of human traces. Seeing these, I feel I face the past and the present. They always use Gu Jin, past, present, past, present, and steely somehow just signifies. But if the steely's extraordinary size seems to allude to something weighty and grand in the past, it bears no signs of wear or damage. And although the man appears to be absorbed in the act of reading the steely's inscription, what we see on the steely is a blank surface without any marks or inscriptions of what he's reading here. The stone monument is therefore empty in terms of both content and time. So we cannot say what it is, what is it for what, what state, there's no information. Whereas this small fan painting is personal and intimate, another example, Wu Li's Cloud White Mountains Blue, it's a serious work charged with uh, suppressed emotion. Considered a major master of early Qing painting, Wu Li studied literature, philosophy, and music from famous Yimin artists, scholars in his youth, and became a committed Ming loyalist himself when he grew up. He's sort of like a post-second generation, like carried on this post-memory because he was born in 1632. The one Ming fall, he was only uh, 12 years old, so he didn't really have much personal memory, but he learned from the other people. So he, the sentiment is still very strong. <clears throat> In a poem, he likened himself to a sick horse loyal to its deceased master. This painting was created in 1668, called The Clouds White Mountain Blue. It is a large hand scroll now housed in Taipei's National Palace Museum. It conveys the same feeling of tragedy and helplessness. That's my reading. But in an ironic, ironic manner, <clears throat> I will explain. It has been suggested the painting's style called the green, uh, blue-green style. 
this very colorful, like a blue-green style. It's traditionally associated with immortality, the IOC immortality, or the legends of the peach blossom spring. So usually these kind of colorful painting uh, represent those themes, immortal paradise or these uh, utopian areas. Uh, for example, uh, here is a, uh, yeah, let's uh, read the painting. So um, opening the scroll, we find a group of uh, flowering trees half blo uh, blocking a mountain cave. Hopefully you can see that cave over there. Similar images are frequently seen in Ming and Qing paintings. I think there's no battery. Yeah, representing this uh, traditional story called the Peach Blossom Spring. Uh, the story of Peach Blossom Spring relates that once a fisherman passed through a cave amidst the blossoming peach trees and emerged into a world of peace and happiness. The villagers explained that people have first come to this uh, secluded place during the troubled time of the Qin Dynasty in the third century BC, uh, had been cut off from the human world ever since. So long before Wu Li, so this story had been painted and this particular uh, colorful style had been used for this story. So Peach Blossom Spring became a favorite subject for painting at the end of the Ming and the early Qing. Wu Li himself did several versions. According to Lin Xiaoping, these paintings are called can be regarded as the pictorial presence of Ming loyalist fantasy for the untouched land of their dreams, like a returning to some kind of dreams. But the 1668 painting is different, this cloud white mountain blue, because it turns the fable into a nightmare. As just mentioned, the painting's first half adapts a traditional pictorial formula in which a cave invites the viewer into a utopian world hidden on the other side of the mountain. Unrolling the scroll, because it is a hand scroll, you unroll the scroll. However, the viewer is stoned by what he finds in the second half of the painting. So here is the second half. There are no happy fairy farmers or fairies. Instead, a memorial city made of pure white stone stands silently beneath an old tree. There is no spring and no flowers. The trees are bare. Hundreds of crows hover over a wintry landscape and block the sun, a terrifying scene described in Wu Li's poem at the end of the scroll. Their sentence starts with this sentence. The rain is over, the skies are distant, the ocean smells of blood. That's the line. It's a very rare people use this seeing blood in the poetry. It's a really kind of uh, terrifying failure. He suddenly turned into a winter. There's a from spring into this different realm. Understood in its contemporary political context, the city, here we see, unmistakably uh, symbolized the perished Ming Dynasty. By substituting a symbol of death for the utopian, utopian dreamland of a peach blossom spring, Wu Li, the artist, announced a painful realization that any hope to resurrect the former dynasty had ended by the end of the uh, 1770s. A significant feature of the painting is that it doesn't represent a visitor in front of the city and seems to differ from Zhang Feng's composition. So here, just the city itself. I would suggest, however, that the image of visitor is uh, substituted by the gaze inherent in the painting. We have become the visitor. You just imagine hands go. So we unroll the painting, actually we are taking a journey, and finally we stand in front of the screen, we become the visitor, very much like that. Uh, <clears throat> so just to compare these two paintings, you can see the city 
define such a center. <coughs> so again, just like uh, John Fong Center here, this city doesn't show any content description or trace of damage, just an empty center or symbol, eternal symbol of this parish dynasty. So why didn't this artist depict a broken city? An image so prominent, uh, so prominent in contemporary writings by Ming loyalists? That's a question I hope uh, we can all think. <laughs> of course, in Western art, we have all these ruins, you know, you portray in England, of course, but why these artists, they didn't do that? <laughs> I think that's an interesting question. One answer, immediate answer is that uh, in doing these paintings, Zhang Feng and Wu Li were following an ancient tradition, a pictorial convention. A uh, scene this uh, famous work uh, attributed to the 10th century master Li Cheng. Uh, so I talk about this painting in my first lecture. I won't repeat it. Basically, there's a city, there's a viewer. The painting probably created 13th century or around that time, but still much earlier than. There are other evidence similar. So just uh, following this tradition, that's a very easy answer. But this explanation doesn't really solve the problem because it doesn't answer how this uh, empty image conveys the strong political sentiment in the painting and inscription. We can say, okay, follow a tradition, but it conveys such emotion, and so how can this image convey this emotion? So um, um, we can assume that when Zhang Feng and Wu Li adopted this old pictorial formula to create their paintings, uh, they were bestowing on the anonymous city a contemporary Ming loyalist political significance. It's not just a general significance, there are particular significance there. But how could an empty signifier like this city image evoke the memory of the formal dynasty uh, past perished dynasty or even of the suicide of the Chongzhen emperor? So that's the question. To answer this question, <coughs> I want to return to this picture. I, again, I discussed a little bit in the first, uh, first lecture, one of Li Gonglin's uh, illustrations of classical classics of theater of piety. So basically just to repeat a little bit of some people were not in the first lecture. Here is a sacrificial scene and you have uh, tablets of the ancestors. They are empty, they have no inscriptions. Then there's uh, descendants uh, making offerings. So I want to read this passage from Li Ji, the Book of Rights, so we understand uh, the meaning of this. Um, so I feel first, pictorially, there is a connection. You have the empty tablets. You see those kind of empty scary, that's a very similar thing. But here we have a sacrifice. Here we have a sort of the viewer. It's a, the, that's ancestor in the past. So I want to just go back to this um, passage from the book Rise, which I really love. So I think that probably one of the most moving ritual instructions in Chinese classics. So he, the descendants or the Ming loyalists, here we can read that he as a Ming loyalist, should think how his ancestors lived and how they smiled and spoke. Think of their views and intentions and think of what he enjoyed. So basically facing these empty tablets, <laughs> he should think. Um, <clears throat> on the third day, he will see those to whom he is conducting the vigil. On the day of sacrifice, when he enters the shrine, he will indeed seem to see the ancestors at his place. After he has made his rounds and is about to go out, with a sense of awe, he will hear the ancestor voices. When he had gone out into the front hall, softly he will hear the ancestor sighs. So it's, uh, I feel for the Ming loyalists, those kind of passages become so powerful in facing the city, thinking about the emperor's suicide, it, all these, uh, even his former family, his, their own ancestors, this uh, conveyed through the memory. So I feel understood in, in this particular political context, 
a plain stele or image or image of a plain tablet or stele, although seemingly visually inadequate, is actually more powerful than a concrete ancestral portrait in generating the viewer's mental concentration or retrieve memory. It's more powerful. I feel a parallel can say, no, Holocaust. How can you represent Holocaust? Mm -hmm. I feel the most powerful image is emptiness. Like a Shoah, the movie, the beginning sequence is the man traveled to the woods and he wanders here. It must be here. Actually, we see nothing, just trees. It's kind of empty. I feel it's a shared. This kind of convention, profound trauma, tragic, cannot be represented by words or by image. You have to somehow come from within. But in art, you still need an image as a place, as a register, as a project your memory and thinking image from your, uh, your, your, your mind. But here, they're talking about not just image, also sound, also a smile, the ancestor, the facial expressions, so a lot of things. So I feel in this context, probably they can understand this better. This is perhaps that Zhang Feng and Wu Li didn't paint architecture ruins as some other Yimi artists did. At this time, some of them did paint ruins. Uh, Dr. Merck wrote a paper about it, but they didn't use that kind of uh, formula to represent steely. They instead, they choose this empty steely. The same idea can also explain the first two groups of images discussed in this lecture. The ghostly image of Kome and the elusive, rarefied structures of the mausoleum of the Ming founder. Together with the empty stilis, these images attest to a particular mode of a vis visuality at the time. We can say Lu Ming loyalist visuality. <clears throat> in all these cases, the epicenter of a representation is rendered transcendental by depicting it as uh, in, uh, terrible. The images position the viewer in reference to a traumatic event that resists a little description, a little representation. So they counter the notion that past is uh, retrievable. This one, the past cannot be retrieved cannot be represented. Instead, they situate the viewer vis-a-vis -vis the intangible presence to a profound absence of loss. That's sort of what I feel here, is how this uh, seemingly so blah a image can convey a very rich information. So I can basically end my talk here, but there is still a lingering question which demands an answer. The where is a broken study in art? <laughs> Still, I haven't answered. Does this imagery simply vanish from visual representation and remain exclusively in literary record? So then we say there's a, really a split. Art, we don't have a broken study only in words. My answer is that uh, actually at the beginning I used this, yes, art is different from literature. So li literature you can describe, here we represent. But later on, I had a different answer. Here is my current answer. My answer is that actually visual representations of damaged and the fractured studies actually exist in abundance, but not in painting, but in the form of ink rubbings. Uh, it's uh, in this form, ink rubbings. Unique in world history, robbings became a major method of production, reproduction, and even a highly praised art form in China from at least the 6th century. So in the uh, West, uh, archaeologists, uh, antiquarians begin to use a crayon to make robbings pretty late. But China from the 6th century became highly developed art form. And so there was a long tradition. During subsequent centuries, this technique developed into a major means of preserving ancient engravings and transmitting famous calligraphy. Rubbings were made with great care and eagerly collected. A large body of literature on the historical value and artistic merit of these rubbings accumulated. 
Commenting on the significance of Robbins for understanding Chinese culture, the early 20th century antiquarian Zhao Lujen drew this analogy. I read, a gentleman not knowing or understanding Robin is like a farmer being unable to differentiate of five grains of a carpenter being unable to use a line maker. So just the importance of Robin in Chinese culture. Actually, all these uh, great antiquarians during the Song, they collected robins, not really the Song carvings. So all Zhao Ming Cheng or some the thousands of the volumes were robins. So we had to remember there was this uh, tradition. I've written a rather long essay on robbing and photography, these kind of issues, so I won't repeat it here. What is important to the present discussion is that a steely robin, also called the bait, is made exclusively to preserve inscribed sign, signs, te text, mainly text, and the trace of ruination. <clears throat> Robin is like a photograph. You just only register the signs and damage the damages. Okay. So in, it therefore provides exactly what is missing from appended studies and in so doing become the surrogates of a study as a specific physical and historical object. So we actually have two, this uh, hollow, empty, pendant study, and we have these uh, rubbings, uh, full of these uh, uh, ruins, the traces of ruins. Very importantly, many Ming loyalists were noted antiquarians. So these loyalists, I just mentioned the Gu Yan War, the, 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 these were all noted antiquarians, whose study of antiquity was yet another way to express their longing for their severed cultural roots. Gu Yan Wu, for example, not only visited ancient cities, but also compiled books entitled Records of Ancient Robins, Ancient Bait, in which he utilized many robins made from ancient cities to construct the past. Following Song Dynasty practice, Gu and his fellow antiquarians left the city in their original locations and collected only robins, which they then mounted as portable scrolls or albums and circulated among fellow collectors, scholars. This way of collecting and recording gives rise to a particular notion of the city where Robin was scrutinized, studied in a scholar's studio, appreciated as an aesthetic object in the scholar's studio for a study of artistic historical information. The study in the wilderness began to acquire the symbolism of history as a totality. History with a capital H. So we have Robin, we can study all the details and information about history then, the city there is looming large in the field, symbolize the history as a totality. It seems that it's a silent but monumental image in the field, gave the past a general shape and meaning, that the city symbolized the origin of historical knowledge and hence embodied historical authority. When we return to Zhang Feng, <coughs> And the Woody's paintings is here. Yeah, so here is a, like a two forms created by the same group of people, collected. One is this kind of image, another is a surface. And so when we return to those uh, paintings and robins, um, <clears throat> we find that the still images in these works reflect the same idealization and abstraction talking about the painting. This study reflects this uh, totality idealization of history. And uh, <clears throat> so those uh, pictorial images of studies do not bear any inscription so that they can be any study and all studies. While symbolizing the past, they are nevertheless uninfluenced by time and thus transcend time. In contrast, a robin always has a definite temporality, as his imprint always attests to a single moment in the history of a city when the robbing was made, a particular conduct of the city that can never be repeated. The robbing is interesting. You can only have one robbing for one moment. 
you can assume theoretically the next hour you make it is different <laughs> because stone changed. So this is a so sharply defined temporality, and here there's no temporality. The startling difference between pendistilis and the steely robins further imply that the two can constitute a composite expression of a comp complementary temporalities. Put Zhang Feng and the Wu Li's paintings side by side with some early Qing robins or damaged historical studies, we find that each group registers a particular kind of absence and presence. The imposing studies in the painting idealize the past without any reference to temporality and the materiality, where the robins, like scarred skins, peeled off the body of the stone studies are full of reference of history, but only through vacant negative imprints. Following this logic, we should perhaps also revisit the other examples discussed earlier in this picture. We should uh, associate, for example, the tranquil images of the Ming mausoleum with the real ruinous monuments. So here I suggest that those images, uh, we shouldn't see them alone as one painting. Actually, they were somehow associated with the real, real thing for the contemporary viewer. Just like a study, you have a one picture, then actually you have Robin, actually probably just next to it. And here, when the Nanjing painters painted this image, this ruined mausoleum was right there. So you have to make this kind of association. And uh, when we see this portrait again, probably we should think about the place. The painting was then in Qinghuai River. The woman lived in Qinghuai River just uh, last year. So there were her physical traces, houses, friends, everything else. So this kind of vacancy, this kind of absence actually should be read together as a part of a composite expression. So we have to study this composite expression. These are uh, just uh, a few things about this uh, last thing. I've been thinking about like a Chinese, you go to a Chinese garden, you often see these ancient buildings that looks really like new because they constantly like a timber structure. You have to restore them, repair them all the time. So you don't feel any temporality. Why, where is the history? But then you see the trees. The trees are old. And actually, I went to this Songshan temple. A monk told me, when you visit a temple, uh, you see the building is bright new, the Buddha is gold, you know, is, uh, the temple is uh, uh, now is doing well. But then if you see trees, if the tree is old, it's a Han dynasty, Han dynasty, you know it's a tradition. So it's again this composite reading. You define a temple. We cannot use a temple or a tree. I feel here, I just end here, because the presence, absence, they have to work together. Just like this tree and her and the painting with uh, her traces, so then the larger context. So I feel this kind of reading, instead of being totally philosophical, I feel eventually it guides us back to our history, analyzed work, and uh, especially historical context. Thank you. Thank you.